Hello everyone and welcome uh, to, to, uh, to this uh, webinar where we will be uh, talking about uh, the AI and uh, the impact uh, that has to terminology management. Um, my name is Ioannis Yakovidis and uh, I am a founder and uh, managing director of Interverum Technology, a company that develops the terminology management software firmware. And uh, I should say good morning, good afternoon, and uh, well, not good evening, I hope, <laughs> to everyone that is joining us from all over the world. Uh, we have about 200 registered, so uh, it's uh, quite some interest uh, for this, this uh, meeting, this webinar. Um, we are actually living in the age of, of uh, automation. Uh, everything has to be faster, uh, better, uh, cheaper. And uh, in this age of automation, we, we notice that, uh, you know, we have these uh, machine translations, different technologies, and uh, we are trying to uh, make everything move uh, more, more, more automated without uh, human intervention as, as much as possible. Um, what this does with AI uh, and making now AI accessible, which is uh, the big thing that we are all noticing uh, around the world, is that without you know, a big investment, uh, we can access some of the powers of AI that was hidden to us before. They were more for in lab, lab laboratory environments or for specific researchers, but it was not so much in the public uh, use. But now uh, this is changing. So we see that uh, we can just uh, go into uh, certain applications, uh, so-called generative applications like uh, AI applications like uh, the chat GPT and uh, you can do start doing searches and uh, uh, get answers uh, so ask questions and get answers and get suggestions and uh, of course there has an impact on the way we communicate uh, there has also an impact on the way that content will be uh, created and shared and uh, it has also an impact uh, on uh, the importance of accurate communication and understanding. And I think that is where terminology comes into play. That is the accuracy in this communication, both to understanding, but also uh, to, to when you're sharing your knowledge, you have to have accuracy. And uh, that is where terminology comes to play a much more important role because more, let's say in the spotlight than ever before. Um, what we are seeing with this, this uh, uh, thing happening also is that we are moving more and more away from just human uh, communication and human, let's say, work. So in the past, you could have, uh, you know, you had an issue with your Ericsson device, you would call support uh, at Ericsson and you would talk with someone who, who has the knowledge, who has the right terminology, who has all this Ericsson kind of uh, specific domain or, or context. Uh, nowadays, we are moving towards chatbots. Uh, so basically, your consumers, they go to your website, they will open a, a chat box, chatbot, chatbot, uh, and they will ask questions. And there, there, is, there are two things that need to happen. First, there has to be an accuracy in understanding. The chatbot has to understand the questions that are uh, asked to them. And then, of course, present the content that is, uh, doesn't go against the ethics, ethical directives, doesn't go against their branding, doesn't go against their, let's say, uh, quality uh, assured uh, con uh, instructions and so on. Um, and there is a challenge. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, chat box can be very helpful, but they can also sometimes uh, go to the other side and create some issues for the, the owner. This is an, a, an example where I asked Bing to tell me the translation of welcome to Sveria, the sense welcome to Sweden, to Greek. So this chatbot just like that told me that I'm sorry, but you know, I don't find it my results. However, you might want to try with uh, Google and also was kind enough to, to send me to the uh, translation uh, address at the Google Translate. So 
what we see more and more is that communication is moved from in the, in the translation uh, is moving from just okay here is a user guide or here's a website or call us to uh, machines uh, using AI to to uh, start accessing content and then start generating content and pro providing it to to uh, the audience and in that situation I think terminology having terminology the correct terminology and having the correct, of course, control mechanisms is crucial to understanding and providing correct content. Uh, because now it's not just one, but it, this can be thousand people uh, that accessing this kind of information. So this is a, the impact, I think, that, that, that terminology management, the terminology, correct terminology starting to have on the AI and the content that this AI different tools are sharing. But also AI itself uh, is starting to have an impact on the way we work as a terminologist on it or in terminology management software, functionality wise and how we access content, how we access term suggestions perhaps, or we have access definitions and so on. So be because we haven't seen, we didn't see, I haven't seen so much talks about how terminology, what is the impact of terminology management uh, for you know towards AI systems but also on the way back how can AI based systems uh, or like ChatGPT impact how we work as terminologists with terminology management this is why we uh, thought okay let's have this this uh, call let's have this discussion let's gather some of the in my mind leading experts when it comes to terminology uh, management and then corporate terminologists and let's listen to their thoughts what, what do they think what are the benefits? Because there are benefits, otherwise people would not be so you know, amazed. So what are the benefits? What are the risks? Where can we use it? Perhaps where shouldn't we? And, and what perhaps we can guess uh, is happening in the future? Uh, so without any more uh, talk, I would like to introduce you to our uh, amazing uh, uh, panel. Uh, I, I see this is a virtual table, a round table, where we are sitting and having a chat, uh, and focusing on these issues or these this, 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 uh, questions. And uh, uh, right today, uh, we will not be accepting uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we might have another call, another webinar, depending on your interest, where we do that much more interactively and when, when we uh, have that. But right at this stage, we would like to focus uh, the discussion on the, on the people that are around the, the table, the panelists. So uh, let me then uh, start with Kara. Can you please uh, uh, introduce yourself? Yes, hello everybody. My name is Kara Warburton. I'm a terminologist. I've been working in this field of terminology management for most of my life. Um, I do consulting for organizations and companies that, that uh, need to set up their own terminology program. And I also teach terminology management uh, as well as other, some other related subjects like uh, controlled authoring, translation, uh, those kinds of topics at the university level. So thank you, Yanis, for inviting me to this panel. Thank you, Kara. We're very happy to have you. Uh, and uh, Barbara, please go ahead. Yeah, like Kara, I'm a terminology consultant and trainer based here in the Seattle area in the United States. Uh, I have done it for about 25 years now. I think this is my 25th year as a terminologist. Uh, and I'm also teaching at NYU and I have been there for 12 years. So that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for joining. Uh, Dr. Arl. Hi, uh, I'm Arl Lamel, senior analyst with uh, market research firm CSA Research. Uh, I've been involved with terminology in one form or another for quite some time and worked closely with Kareth, among others, on the TBX standard. Thank you, Arl, and uh, welcome. Uh, Henrik? Hey, everyone. I'm Henrik Nilsson, also a terminology consultant. Um, I work in a company mainly specializing in healthcare and defense, but I have several organizations that I help with terminology. I'm also currently the president of the European Association for Terminology, EFT, and I teach terminology at the University of Greenland as well. Thank you, Henrik, and welcome as well. And uh, from the 
terminologist uh, Fiona. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Fiona. I'm working at GoTo as Senior Terminology Manager. So I hope to tell a little bit more from the company perspective. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Very welcome to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, Sandra? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. I, my, I've been in the language industry for many, many moons uh, as a translator and recently as a corporate terminologist, both in financial services and now life sciences. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, Niklas? Yes, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Niklas Johnson. I, uh, I've been working as a terminologist at Scania, a truck and bus manufacturing company in Sweden, uh, for for about 16 years now. Uh, and I have a background in linguistics from the Stockholm University. Thank you, Niklas. And uh, well, me, you already heard about, so I will not repeat myself. So, as I said from the start, I I do have a very I'm very curious by nature. So I did start uh, very early. As, as soon as I saw this chat GPT and everything, I uh, uh, started uh, to uh, uh, check out how uh, this uh, would work and how could be used in our kind of area in terminology management. And I have some kind some some little examples uh, here. So. One of the things that I did was I wanted to try it out to see if it would work for term extraction. So what I did was, have you noticed that you can be very impolite when with this kind of chat GPT? I mean, it's not uh, always please and hello. I, I just said, okay, give me, give me the list of the 100 most important terms in the following text. And I just, just copy pasted the text. In this case, I think it's from some kind from, from Apple, uh, MacBook Pro user guide kind of thing so not too complex or anything like that um, so the question was to the chat gpt just give me the 100 most important terms of course what does most important terms mean actually but anyway i just wanted to try it this is what i got so i did actually get a list of let's say suggestions i extract the list of terms uh, from the text several of them actually made sense and of course, I, I, there were some of them like page 58 uh, and, and some, something like that, that also came in. Uh, it couldn't find 50 uh, or, or top 100, I think I, I said. It couldn't find as many because there weren't. So that's a good thing. It doesn't, doesn't just you know uh, add nonsense, complete nonsense just to fill that part. But it did just give me a, a very quick list of, of, uh, of terms. Now, I don't know. The principles behind, I don't know how we did the extraction, if it is statistical or it is morphological, if it is, what is it? Uh, and it's only monolingual. But I just really quickly wanted to get a list of uh, uh, suggestions, term suggestions, very quickly from a text. And I, I have to say that it did a pretty good job in this, let's say, limited and easy example. Now, another thing that I also tried was to give me a suggestion for definitions because you know you, you th this is a everyday scenario you have uh, some terms and then you or new term suggestion you you will have it in your glossary or your term base uh and uh, you need to let's say okay come up with come up with is not a good but anyway come come to a this definition so i said okay uh, I, I have the term computer so as you can see up here this is me asking give me three definitions for the term computer and yeah, I got three definitions. I don't know where they come from. It's like a, a black box somewhere. I don't know the source. I don't know if they are good or bad, but I got three definitions and they sound pretty okay, right? Of course, computer is not the most advanced term in the world. Uh, so in that in that aspect, I mean, in, that, in this way, it worked pretty well. I got, I got some suggestions and now I can work with them and say, okay, well, I can accept this in our own kind of environment. I went one more step though, and I said, okay, and now give me a synonym to computer. And you can see here, well, one synonym for computer is digital device. Okay, not too bad. So uh, that, that makes sense. And then I went one more step and I said, okay, and how do you say, how, how do you say computer in Swedish? Note, I didn't say, how do you translate in Swedish? I didn't say, how do you say computer in Swedish? Like a, like a human would say. Uh, 
uh, a Greek human at least. So, and, 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 the, and he said, well, the Swedish computer is daughter, which is true. So I could have a very quick uh, and, and let's say uh, pretty good communication and uh, get some pretty good results in this very easy and simple example. All the time, it's very, very important to note this is not complex stuff. This is a co the term computer that's everywhere. But I could, from all this, this cloud of information, I could just get uh, some kind of manageable and, and pretty good uh, suggestions um, that I can actually work with and use. But again, where do they come from? I have no idea. I mean, it didn't say, it doesn't say that, you know, well, here is a definition from standard IEEE, blah, blah, or here is a definition from that. It just says, well, here are three definitions for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also went now and did another thing. Uh, this is a this is a bit trickier thing because it's more focused, and uh, this is a term that we have already in a term base. And I wanted to see how more if I'm becoming more specific and more complex, uh, let's say complicated, uh, what would happen. And I asked uh, the chat uh, GPS to send me provide me a term suggestions for definition for the definition, and then I have this exact definition which is actually in a, in a standard. This is a standard from a standard. Uh, so I know what the, let's say, approved terms or terms should be uh, according to the standard. So I said, yeah, well, give me some, provide me some term suggestions for this kind of definition. And I got a list. And the, the thing is, they, they look like terms that could be possibly correct. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I have to be a, 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 an expert in this area to, to be 100% sure. And I'm asking here, what is the source? So I'm trying to understand, okay, where did this, does this AI master get these term suggestions? Where do they come from? Uh, I, I have a list, but where do they come from? What is the source? Then I get, I, I apologize for any confusion. I, I'm just AI language model, but I cannot tell you the source. So there I'm getting some suggestions, but then I get the pullback, you know, I don't know where, I, I'm just AI, don't ask me. And the thing is, if I didn't know better, I could just get some of these terms or term suggestions, add them in my, uh, let's say, uh, term base and say, well, this, that's it, these are the ones. But I know uh, that these are the correct ones. 15 supergroup assembly modulating equipment, whatever that means, uh, and hypergroup modulating equipment. This is a, these are the two terms that are according to the, the standard. These are the, the ones uh, in English. And none of them is here. So we have a lot of things that are could be, but these are according to that definition that is from a standard. So this could also result in some kind of false security, some tunneling where you think that the presented term suggestions are the ones that are the relevant ones. Uh, and I start working with them, but I completely miss some other type of information that could be the correct one, well, let's say the, the more proper one. So this is also something that I, I found uh, in, in uh, when I played around a bit uh, uh, with, uh, with ChatGPT mainly. Okay, so uh, then I can do like this, I stop a bit and jump back to, to my audience. And I think it's, it's uh, more time to start listen to you. What do you think about, about these things? So, so my first kind of question would be, uh, have you started using this? Have you started using AI solutions, uh, generative AI solutions like ChatGPT in the way that I showed you or in another way? Uh, and are there any benefits? Do you, do you find that they, this could be a good thing or we will talk about risk later. So let's focus on the good stuff to begin with. So uh, Let's start with Nicholas because I'm, I'm always curious uh, about companies like Scania. You know, you are very traditional and very, uh, uh, very much, uh, you know, not jumping on things. How, how have you have you started to look into this stuff? Yeah, uh, well, there is a lot of talk about uh, generative AI in in the company in different uh, parts of the company, uh, but for us. Uh, terminologists and uh, in the service market uh, area we have been uh, advised not to use it um, at least for now uh, because we don't actually want too much of our content to end up on on third-party servers 
and uh, uh, especially, um, uh, I mean, the the terminology process at Scania is is uh, it goes like this: it it starts with a with new technology, and the engineers coming up with with uh, new techniques for for doing uh, something or inventing new machines. And that's the time when we uh, create terms for this new, these new techniques and add it to our terminology, terminology database, Scania Lexicon. Mm. So uh, this is at, an, at a very early stage. And mm. if we try to find definitions, for instance, uh, with chat uh, uh, GPT, then um, uh, we might have confidential information ending up on, on other servers. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. the reason uh, I think behind the Fiona, the you, you, you did some chat, uh, chat, uh, uh, some tests I know, uh, and you had some some experience. Uh, what uh, tell us? Uh, yeah, well, we're not using it like this right now, but um, we definitely want to learn about it and explore and start building our knowledge about it. Uh, but I definitely have to um repeat what nicholas is saying when you start developing something new obviously you don't want to have it out there before it's officially developed and um out in the market um so i think it's more usable for things if you need to basically um do descriptive terminology management so you don't like to add stuff to the term base which is simply not in the term base because you didn't have resources so far you didn't have the capacity to really research. Um, and I think regarding our products, it's, well, everyone can use it without being a customer. As soon you're kind of invited, so all people listening are using our product, obviously, right now. So you do see terminology anyway. Um, so um, there's not that much to hide compared to a technology company like uh, Scania is. So um, I think the, the security things are there a little bit different um so but yeah, do you see but, some benefits i mean uh quick and dirty <laughs> translation or something like that uh would you would you uh, would you use it for, for um, this a quick extraction from from a material that is already online uh, yeah but i think it's it's still important to have an expert in the whole um mm -hmm. role because it does help for research it does help for your first draft it does help for um, having a good idea or maybe also understanding things you might not understand if you're not speaking a language but mm. in the end really saying if something is true or not or you know if there's this slight difference um, it's always good to still ask an expert about it but it definitely can help um, to reduce the whole effort about doing research and getting the first draft there in the first mm. place. What do you think, Barbara? I mean, you're you're teaching these uh, things, uh, and I know you have started using it as well a bit. What, what is your? Yes, I I mean, like most of us in the industry, of course, you start playing with it and see what it can do. But I actually thought about it in a in a different way. I thought, what are the tasks that we need to do as as terminologists, and where could it be most helpful? Mm -hmm. Where would it be most dangerous in a way? And you my focus on test, benefits right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Let, let, well, you, you cannot do one without the other, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, term extraction like you, when I, when I gave it a particular text, it was actually really, really good. Now, it could be sheer luck, right? Because it knew a lot about the domain or maybe the text that I gave it was structured very well. Um, the amazing part was it was a German text on terminology management. Mm -hmm. And it gave me not just the 20 most important terms, like you, I ask it, what are the 20 most important terms in the text? It also gave me the English equivalents. And because I'm an expert in that field, I could actually tell, yes, these are all important terms, and yes, these are correct equivalents. So that was a pretty amazing first test. That may not be true across domains. Um, it may not be true across languages, etc. or it will not always give me equivalents. I mean, I really didn't understand why on earth it thought. I also needed it in English. Um, probably because I ask it in English. 
Um, so that was an amazing first test. Um, I then, not all of them, by the way, were in canonical form. And that's, of course, something that we need. We want the terms to be in their base form. And that I did not get the tool to do, even though I instructed it to, to give me canonical forms. Uh, and then I tried to extract context, because that's, you know, when we use a term extraction engine, we always need a piece of context in order to continue to process the information and it could not do that. It would always give me a sentence that was modified in some form and context for us needs to be verbatim. Mm -hmm. And and that I find really surprising because I even described here, I wanted to be verbatim. It just would always modify it. Um, and then definition authoring, of course. And there too, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's useful but not that much more useful than when I do a Google search, to be honest with you, because it, it'll present me information that I have to double check anyway. I cannot just trust it. Mm -hmm. So those were mm -hmm. the three uh, experiments I did, term extraction, uh, context extraction, and uh, definition authoring and um, mm -hmm. in, my exper in my experience right now. Okay, Kara, do you agree with this? Uh... Well, I, you're asking us to focus on the good things right now, correct? Yes, yes. The, the good the bad. We, don't, we don't want to bury it from the start, so we'll start with okay. the good. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think that for me, if, if I could simplify this in really basic terms, I see this tool as useful for doing very specific things, like, you know, pr propose a definition or extract a few terms or... Uh, you know, uh, give me a sample sentence and things like that. Uh, but uh, let me try to compare this to building a house to be very basic, okay? It can't build the house. You can tell it to put in a toilet or, or put some tile on the floor or add the lock to the door or, you know, um, pour some concrete, but you can't tell it to build the house. So, mm -hmm. You know, it's doing, it's capable of doing some small tasks. And in that sense, it can be an aid to terminologist. Uh, again, I, I, uh, I, I come back to what you said though, and Barbara as well about the source. You, we don't know the source of this information. So it's always tentative information. Sometimes that's okay uh, in some situations, but uh, terminologists want to be sure about things. And, you know, I, I would be kind of like Barbara. I would want to know the source. I would want to double check. I would probably, you know, um, do due diligence and take another step. And in that case, is that saving me time? Not really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, the other thing about term extraction, yeah, I did. I tried it as well, and it was interesting, but I I didn't have a chance to. And this is something we all need to do: is to compare it to a uh, dedicated term extraction tool that is specifically designed for term extraction why would i use you know um it's like a terminology management system why would i use uh you know quick term or whatever in some kind of cat tool when i can use a dedicated terminology management system like TermWeb? i wouldn't because they have limitations right so i i said what what why would i use something like this when i can try sketch engine or or thermostat or something that is or wordsmith or something that has uh, very sophisticated linguistic uh, algorithms within it, and I can trust it. Uh, it's something that I know is using a reference corpus. You said yourself, Yanis, you don't know how it works. None of us knows how it works. It's a black box. But here with a tool that we can study, like let's say Sketch Engine, we know we can use a reference corpus. We can choose the reference corpus we want to use. We know how to, how it works. We know we can we can configure it to do certain things, you know, certain uh, patterns and so on. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to to use this kind of like black box thing uh, when we already have really good tools at our disposal. Um, like I said, I think it's a it's a very good. Uh, it is impressive. I have to admit that I've tried it. I have tried to find ways to to make it make mistakes, and it's not easy. <laughs> but I have found some, by the way. When we get to that part of the of this of this webinar, I would love to say more things. But you know, it's yeah, it's just something we can't fully trust, and that's that's where I I would stand with it. And it doesn't, like I say, it doesn't build the house. 
if I yeah. need to build a terminology resource for a translation project for a client, ChatGPT can't do that for me. No, uh, but, but perhaps it can help you. It can help, uh, yeah. you know, it could be the hammer. I, I, I use the hammer as an example. Uh, a hammer is a tool. If, if you use it correct way, it, you can put the nail in the, in the wood, but you can also use it incorrectly and it's completely useless. So, so uh, it doesn't mean it's, it's useless. It's just, it's not for everything and, and all, I guess. Um, so Henrik, you, you say that your focus is a lot in uh, uh, healthcare and in uh, defense. Would you dare to, do you see any benefits using kind of uh, this, these uh, tools uh, as a, an assistance? Uh, I think it's it's very exciting times. <laughs> I feel like a child sometimes. It's very uh, to try it and see what it can do. Um, and it's like having a new colleague, a creative colleague that doesn't get tired, if you look at it positively. Uh, because in a meeting on information security terminology, one of the experts suddenly produced, well, I've added it, I've added a definition in the chat. I thought he said, so I went to the chat. There was a definition in English. Uh, or even Swedish, I don't remember. But anyways, where did this come from? Yes, from the chat. Yes, okay. and looking at the chat. So he had been producing definitions during the actual meeting mm -hmm. of the concepts that we were discussing. All of a sudden, there were things in those definitions that we didn't think of. And it set us off, off discussing, is this really correct? Why didn't we think of this? So again, the, the trust issue was raised, but again, the, the, I asked it to create some some Swedish terms for some uh, English uh, new uh, new terms in society. It did present something, you know, just to widen your your mind, get some suggestions. Uh, I know that it was uh, they did take scattered uh, notes from electronic health records and mm -hmm. made it structure it and link it to SNOMED. The, the big sort of medical system provided with coding and not all of it was completely wrong mm -hmm. and this is where you find something in healthcare which is really interesting can you structure unstructured patient data and get it to get codes from a system which is uh, mm -hmm. recognized and used by everyone this was i think really interesting in on another level well then you almost leave terminology into something but it's this to me was very exciting so if i'm just saying on the positive side it's like yes you know the new creative <laughs> colleague that you wanted suppose in real life but does it and lie to you yeah, probably it lies then is it a good colleague well i'm not sure exactly always has an answer always there to help but you are not 100 percent sure that the answers or the help it gives you is correct so you have to double check all the time so i'm not sure in the long run if you are really happy with such a colleague right um, Sandra, what is your experience? Well, I have limited experience just playing with it. Um, same as Kara, just trying to do some term extraction, but and trying to do term extraction from a bilingual corpus, and mm -hmm. um, particularly Spanish. And I was very interested in the very the variants of Spanish, so throughout Latin America, and it it, it was interesting. Nothing. Uh, of value to speak of, um, I would go back to Sketch Engine, just as Kara had mentioned. If I'm looking, <clears throat> excuse me, if I'm looking at uh, term extraction as 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 a way to use it, um, mm -hmm. I think we the automation is 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 great if we can get it there, but there's always some human mediation that's going to be necessary, mm -hmm. um, and the re the research has to always remain at the forefront yeah and, and and you know in sometimes it's 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 more challenging to be getting a, a content that is almost right you know this almost in our world can be between the the, the difference between life and death uh, mm -hmm. yeah almost correct <laughs> you know this 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 medicine you can almost take and survive but but it doesn't so in in i think in situations where we need accuracy uh, it's not there yet uh, but in some ways it could be let's say a rough first beginning uh Arl, what, what, do you, what is your experience uh, and again benefits right now so we were not talking about the, the other side of the course well I, i'd like to start by clarifying one thing that barbara said when she talked about it changing context i think it's important to understand that these things don't actually store 
the context examples. They store uh, numeric hashes of them that allow them to generate new content. So that's mm -hmm. why it can't spit back a context sentence verbatim because it's generating something, it's spinning it up, it's making it up. Um, and so that is going to be one of the limitations. Mm. But at the same time, one of the strengths is the access to this huge volume of information. Now, if I were in, in Nicholas's situation or Henrik's, I'm not sure I'd use it, but if I were a freelance translator, that access to large reams of information is very compelling. Um, one concrete example is years ago, I did a translation from Hungarian to English, and I encountered uh, a portion that dealt with 19th century Viennese piano actions in detail. And I took about eight hours mm -hmm. of research to figure out how to translate one paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran that same content that took me all that time to find through chat GPT. And within about three minutes, I actually had what had taken me eight hours to gather. Now, mm. if I were doing it the first time, then I'd have to go off and verify it. But because I'd seen it before, I could verify it was right. And for me, that was a very compelling um, time saver. So seeing it as a tool to find things that you can't otherwise find as a translator would be attractive. But then again, from the enterprise perspective, I'm not sure I'd trust it. Mm -hmm. And speaking about the context and and, and source and then that is so hard to get from this technology. I mean, I, I'm you know you are keeping asking what is the source? Tell me where you get this from. Tell, I mean, the contextual information fine, it's generative and stuff. But source, I mean, there should be some kind of uh, information somewhere that says you know this text I grabbed from that place and this from here or something. And you would you would think, but somehow. Uh, these engines don't work like that because there's so vast information and data, uh, so 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 they don't have this this accessible. Um, and uh, in our branch, in terminology management branch, let's see how important is source and, and context. I mean, we touched it a bit, uh, but how key is it? Do we really have to? Can we skip some of this stuff? You know, when you you talk about people that are focusing on translation work. For them, terminology is just like a glossary on the side. Then for them, is automating and getting the translation working. And okay, we have some list of terms, but that, do we really need all these uh, fields and the meta information and all that stuff? How important is it? And and uh, would that be a, a, let's say uh, something that would uh, uh, stop the use right there for for this kind of tool? Because I don't get the source. I don't know this content. Uh, Let's say, well, Barbara, what do you think? This is a bit yeah. more yeah, theoretical kind of. Well, um, I, I, I really appreciate that Arl knows a little bit more. I said in when we <laughs> said good morning this uh, before the recording started uh, that Arl knows everything. <laughs> and so he <laughs> filled in some of the details that, of course, I don't know because I don't, I'm not an, uh, an AI expert. Um, and, and for us to understand a little bit more about it is really necessary, right? Not only for us to use it successfully ourselves, but also in our teaching capacities to instruct uh, students to use it responsibly in a way. And so to understand that, yes, it cannot extract a context, for example, for that reason, even though, uh, by the way, our like gave it a text and I would have expected it to say, hey, here is a sentence that uses this, uh, that, that should have worked. And maybe we can, with better instructions, get it to do that anyway. Um, uh, but going back to sources, um, it really depends on at what point in your research you employ or you use that hammer, so to speak, going back to your uh, house building analogy. If, if you're stuck in the very beginning, let's say when we translate, for example, we have hunches that give us the first step in a way. And if we're stuck at the very beginning and say, hey, I just need some ideas on where to go, maybe something like ChatGTP could be actually very helpful. Where I think it's not very helpful is if we use it exclusively and say, oh, here's the answer. I always need to follow up and say, well, is this what the experts say? Is this the definitions they use? Is this the term they use? 
Um, so if it is that tool in our toolbox, then uh, it is very helpful. Uh, one other thought that I had as we were discussing the various tasks, uh, of course, the problem that we have right now, and maybe not anymore in the future, if, if tools makers uh, listen to us, is that um, we need a certain workflow. And so to use Sketch Engine or another term extraction tool makes sense because I have a tool that gives me a certain workflow that allows me to be really productive. If I just go to ChatGPT and do all these tasks individually, it may take way too long for this day and age. And so um, that's another aspect that's not really in place right now for certain tasks anyway. Kara, how important is context uh, in terminology management? How important is contextual information? Uh, that we cannot get well, so easily <laughs> from, from... Yeah, it is very important because it's a, one of the ways of disambiguating uh, between words that have multiple meanings. You know, I mean, terminology management is concept oriented, so every concept is distinct. And uh, sometimes you can only determine that distinction through a context or obviously also a definition. So, yeah, I mean, we... we we find that the context is very important, again, to disambiguate words that have, you know, um, fuzzy meanings or potentially more than one meaning, and, and also to determine the authenticity of a translation because of the problem of, of translation ease of influence of the source language. Um, you can't just translate terms, you know, we don't translate them, we, we look for equivalents. So, um, so yes, context is authentic context, and this is why Barbara mentioned she didn't want the machine to just re make something up. It has to be authentic in the source language, and not, it cannot be a translation, and it cannot be fabricated. Mm -hmm. and, and and made up, uh, or uh, yeah. Uh, so if we go back to to uh, Niklas, uh, w w do you have contextual information in your term base? Uh, is it something? That you uh, well, not 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 that much, but uh, I want to go back to the uh, source references. We work a lot of, uh, when we create terms and, and definitions. Uh, we work a lot about uh, with with uh, uh, the sources. I mean, mm -hmm. we make reference back to the sources where we got things, the information, and uh, when we add new terms, we always have. Uh, I mean, we have to look up stuff. And uh, we get information from experts and so on as well. But uh, uh, to the extent that we have uh, uh, different databases or, or, or encyclopedias and things as a source, mm -hmm. we, we uh, uh, make note of the sources because that's the way to build a consistent uh, uh, term base or, or also to, to be able to go back and say that, okay, this is where I got this from. This is why I formulated the definition in this way. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's very important to in, in our process. Mm -hmm. Fiona, how about you? Pretty similar, actually. So um, we do have um, like the, the source of the definition, or like where we found that stuff, and also um, we we have a workflow where we um, collect basically information about the request in the first place. So like where this is this that this came from was it in an email or whatever like all this kind of context in that kind of sense mm -hmm. um but not that much about a specific term itself um except it's like in the product ui itself so we can have a screenshot but that's always depending on yeah well how good people are working on this or how good we can get it basically mm -hmm. Henrik what do you say? Well, I'm thinking about again what Arl said. I'm happy you're here. They can help us, which are not all of us who are not experts. But uh, because you need to find, always look at the sources and, and check their validity, whatever you use, and unless there are sort of um, something which is considered to be good quality from the start. So mm -hmm. if you have something created based on lots and lots of real material text this is like the good 
way to get an overview I wouldn't have been able to do in, in other contexts. But I asked a, um, an Italian colleague and she had heard it, it made up in some references, again, also sources that seemed very plausible, but then when they were checked did not exist. And this is of course very sort of, unless you understand the whole system and that it actually creates things, this would be a very difficult thing and tricky thing to, to, to make something seem like a, a good source and then it's not mm -hmm. because this it is it is key they had the sources you use uh, then in many cases the the content is produced with a group of experts live so we sit we, we formulate this is the the definition and this is the note etc uh, but there, there's still normally it's not out of the blue it comes from some sources and, and being them or some written material but making up plausible sources is very serious i think yeah exactly and then depending on what area it is it, it is varied how serious the seriousness can be varied as well uh sandra what's your take i mean do you have a source uh, is that important for you absolutely i think uh the source goes back to ensuring that you have reliable data and that your mm. partners can trust you right that you have good sources but i think um, one thing we haven't touched upon is copyright uh, infringement. You're coming to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that's a very so, good point. Absolutely. So you, you have to know, and, and for term-based, it's it's you absolutely whether you have definition sources or context sources, you have to demonstrate that. And yeah, yeah. Where, where, where does it come from? Uh, and, and is it relevant in our our kind of uh, area and our kind of business and, and so on? Uh, yeah, but you know, on, on the flip side, if the AI tool is creating the sources, then you may not be sued, right? Because you don't know where it's coming from. That's mm -hmm. one way of doing it, right? Arlo, what, what is uh, your take? Uh, um, well, uh, to use an example of what Hendrix said, I, I asked ChatGPT about myself, and according to it, I'm a professor at the uh, University of Malmö, where I've never even been, and it's, I've written several <laughs> papers that I've never written. So I I'm had the same experience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, you're at Malmu as well? <laughs> well, no, they said, it said I was working at the University of Ottawa. I've never worked there. I've never, you know. <laughs> so so you're, you're telling me go there when you feel a little down <laughs> and let Chet <laughs> <laughs> boost you up some. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, but I do think this is one of the key issues we're seeing right now with this is around the sourcing and the reliability and liability that comes from this. And one of my predictions for this year is we're going to see at least one high profile uh, legal case mm. over something that's come out of one of these generative AI mm. uh, things where there's been improper use and improper vetting and somebody's going to become the legal precedent that none of us want to be. Mm. So I, I think this is something we all need to watch very closely. Yeah, and I think you, so, so what I'm hearing from you is that you would not uh, dare to use directly content coming out from the engine uh, without knowing source, without knowing the contextual information, just like that. Uh, so already there, it's kind of a limitation. Uh, if you t don't tell me where you get this information from, I don't trust you. And, and one big thing I think with this uh, generative AI and the content that you're getting is trust. How can I trust that what I'm reading is correct if you don't tell me where you get this from, right? So the trust is, I think, a, a big uh, issue. In that. Think uh, of it as like having a, a uh, eager but not terribly bright intern who always forgets <laughs> to document things. Yeah. And I think, as like Sandra touched this, uh, this uh, the, the, there are security risks, right? You're accessing content, maybe you, you put it in your term base. Where does it come from? Maybe you are, uh, whose intellectual property is it? Who owns this? Uh, maybe at some point down the line, someone will come back and say, hey, great, now I sue you. <laughs> because you are using, you know, in a package somewhere, uh, a brand or something that you don't know is a brand uh, for your own products without even knowing because you grabbed it from somewhere. So uh, what do you say uh, when it comes from these solutions? Is it a high risk that, that uh, the intellectual property, this information, sensitive information? It could be information that some other company has shared by mistake, which is sensitive information for them, being accessible in an engine, and then you grab it and you, you do it. You don't believe this, but already there was a case with a development, software development company in gaming 
where they used ChatGPT or some kind of technology to do some error search, debugging. And uh, they were instructed not to use their like live code, but people did it anyway. So they threw the code to see, you know, very quickly to get some some suggestions where the bug. And this turned out to be a very the latest product product that they were developing. And they just put it out there, uh, shared with everyone. So people do mistakes, even though you tell them not to. Uh, if you don't ban in some way, uh, they, they, these things might happen. Um, now, so so. Potentially, there is a problem, as you all uh, noted, that, that, yeah, I would not access this content because it could be leading to the, this kind of situations uh, when I don't know where it's coming from. Um, so, could, could, I just add, you know, could I just add one thing about, because copyright is not new, you have the same problem even with the sources you used before. So, yes. in one way, this would be more positive because you have cases where people rewrite slightly definitions to make them publishable. And this, if this already recreates, and if you could decide, I want you to create something on this basis, use these sources, create something new, and then I can use it and see if it's good, then I would sort of escape the copyright issue if I'm mm -hmm. looking at this positively now again. So. Yes, absolutely. I Maybe but, I'll quickly follow yes. on on that because as you were talking, one of the things that I have not tried is let it suggest new terms. And I think you did this, Janis, in your in your demo. I think that's where it could actually be uh, um, useful. I am notoriously uncreative as far as creating new terminology. That's not my strength. But here I have a tool that could assist me in that. And there are. There have been plenty of cases in, in my uh, 25 years where I needed to come up with a good target term and mm -hmm. I was just lacking the inspiration. It was a new concept that did not exist in the other language and now I needed some inspiration and I think for that uh, chat GPT could actually be very useful. Uh, and another case where um, product names in a company were actually uh, uh, engine generated they had created an engine and let their product names be created by a tool rather than by humans and then vetted it uh, just the human vetted it basically and that's where it could be helpful as well of course you wouldn't want to dump all your product names into a public uh, uh, generative ai tool and let it suggest a new one that would be stupid but uh, you could integrate that kind of technology in the your corporation and mm -hmm. and let it help you um so so that there is definitely potential there that had only occurred to me as we were uh, speaking yeah thank you barbara i mean we are coming to the point where how would you like to have the ai integrated in your terminology tools because that is also something that i would, would like to to listen uh to listen to uh so uh so so how, should we have policies in place? I mean, Elon Musk said, uh, you know, stop this before we have policies in place. Of course, everything he says has uh, money on the back, uh, back background uh, uh, but, uh, reasoning. But what, what, do, what, do, what do you think? I mean, do, do you think, let's start with corporates. Uh, in Scania, do you have already policies in place that uh, limit the use or is it more like a recommendation at this point? Yeah, it's a, um, at the moment, it, it's just a recommendation and uh, if we would start using it in a, some systematic way, we would, of course, need policies mm -hmm. for uh, for using it in a in, in a proper way and and not make um, um, uh, mistakes um, uh, mm -hmm. that we could avoid. But um, um, yeah, so so we would, of course, need that if we were to begin using it. Fiona, do you have? already or not yet we don't have yet uh, but i would agree if it's like in a really daily use i would say or like inside mm -hmm. then we should have some what i could imagine is if you like in terms of for example a terminology management tool that there are like for example the term extraction or research like suggested definition basically that all these prompts, because it's really about asking the right questions and not forget any kind of instructions, but mm -hmm. that can be kind of a standardized way already. So uh, regarding uh, source, actually, I did ask for a source of a definition and a 
it was quite interesting because I had to really ask it in the right way because otherwise it was like, yeah, well, you can find it in a dictionary. And I'm like, yeah, but which dictionary? Like, tell me the URL. Oh, okay. Do you have to say so, please or something like that? There's a secret. Can you can you have the source please? <laughs> yeah, you can you can really test it and see how do I need to ask the right question to get the right answer I need basically. I so um, I think if you can standardize these things and put it in a tool, so you simply have to click a button and have a list for I don't know 50 terms um, or basically concepts. Um, and you simply need to check them and get the review mm -hmm. step on it. You save a lot of time because you don't have to Google all that stuff, basically. <laughs> because for me in software, I do use Google obviously very much. I, I can't use books too much because mm -hmm. it's simply not in books usually. Um, mm -hmm. so I think such a button and such a tool could really help and save a lot of time. Arl, what do you say about policies? Um, I think it's vital if people don't want to become that cautionary uh, tale of the one that got sued. Uh, and I think, yeah. but at the same time, the policies need to be flexible enough because a lot of corporations just say, don't touch it. Well, mm -hmm. that's not viable either. People are going to be using it. So you need to have something that protects the interests of the organization while at the same time allowing the flexibility to experiment and gain experience for what you are going to use it for. Um, but that's a that's a conversation that needs to take place with your infosec teams, your legal team, and your executive team, mm -hmm. and probably needs to happen regularly because of just how fast this stuff changes. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I can tell you from our end, it's been I, I call 2020 22 for the age of uh, uh, the the IT security documents. Uh, we I don't know. Almost all of our customers uh, came back and their IT department suddenly with these huge questionnaires about uh, content, data, data ownership, data, how, where is it stored, how is it stored, uh, a lot of detailed questions. And then now, 2023, we, we, we are talking about uh, this, okay, how do we train engines without any control and share data and access data? Where does this come in? Because that is a major, uh, let's say, potential risk for, for uh, corporate corporate users and companies. Um, now, we talked about a lot about accessing content, right? We, so we, we, we tell the engine, tell, give me some term suggestions or give me a source of definition and, and so on. How about training there? I mean, how about pushing our data to train these uh, uh, engines? I mean, uh, for these engines to be, to be working properly, you need to train them, you need to, to, to feed them. And the AI, I know that they, they, they are very thirsty. They, they thirst for uh, structured data, high quality data, which is, of course, a term base. I mean, you have people sitting there putting all this meta information, making sure it is correct, that so many levels of uh, uh, stages of translation, validation, and so on. Would you dare, uh, as things are right now, a black box perhaps to, to share, to feedback and train um, uh, an engine uh, like that, uh, and let's let's uh, Nicholas, sh shall I ask you? I think the uh, and Fiona, I think the, the the answer is no, right? I mean, you would not feed back to to this. Uh, let's ask Fiona. What what do you what do you say? Uh, I can't say yes and I can't say no because it really depends on on the concepts and the terms, basically. Because for some part, it obviously does make sense if our customers would know and understand what's behind the concept, mm -hmm. basically. So. Um, and some terminology we do have in a glossary um, out there anyway, so why not feed it because it's already in the web anyway. So mm -hmm. um, but I think it's very crucial for um, better MT basically um, and to really, if you want to create content like let's say marketing text or whatever, with that kind of tool it does make your content more unique and more again the voice of your company but mm -hmm. then again the question is like would there be a way to have that in this corporate environment so it's not basically mm -hmm. out there where everyone can access it yeah and they are starting to talk about hybrids uh, because this this concern is actually one of the hinders where people are not really so much willing to share and, and feedback they they are very much willing to access content but not 
give back, so to speak. And they are talking about hybrid models where where this security kind of uh, becomes a bit uh, more tight. Uh, Niklas, what do you say? Would you would you share back? Um, I think we have uh, we have uh, official terms and and also terms which are for technique under development sort of yes so um, the the official part of the of the term base of course we uh, we uh, we could share it uh, because it's uh, it's about uh, uh, things that are already on the market so mm -hmm. Sandra is this the same uh, your what what's your take on this uh, I, I think for now, until all the risks are understood, there's there'll be no sharing. <laughs> no sharing. Okay. All right. That, that, that's fine. That's fine. And then uh, Henrik, how about you? What what is your uh, take? I was thinking of the academic context again, where we have sort of seen you have to handle also in teaching terminology. We changed the exam because the questions given by the chat GPT was they were too good to. So we had to change the questions. But then feeding back from, in this case, university material of good quality, which is not as sort of secret, but made to be shared. This could perhaps be interesting. You could compare to the Fed term project where actually high quality terminology was given back to the European machine translation system to make it produce better translations in the end. Mm -hmm. Something similar to this would be, but this was sort of outside of all the copyright issues were solved and the quality was there. But so perhaps in an academic context, this could somehow be interesting to uh, mm -hmm. feedback thing. Yes, and and uh, that is that is of course true. And for for data that is already there, I mean there are a lot of public term bases already. Uh, the European Union has a huge term base, and that could be easily. Uh, shared let's say to 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 with this this data but i think again the source has to be available so when i'm accessing this terminology from this kind of external sources i would like to also understand what where does it come from uh, so that i know that this is something i can trust um Ar, what do you what do you think what do you say um at present i'd be very leery of contributing um, mm -hmm. some of these things back. But I think what we're going to see, and, and in fact, we're already starting to see some of this, is a move away from the large language models to subsets of the large language models that are relevant. And these have advantages of being much more efficient and easy to run. And there'll be something that rather than relying on somebody with a, you know, a, a, a hectares large uh, server farm to run, you might be able to run internally with a much smaller footprint. And then you can contribute your information securely to it, it never leaves your, your control. And then you gain those advantages without the risks. And I think we're gonna see a lot more work on this in coming months. Mm -hmm. so, so smaller, let's say, kind of environments, uh, limited environments where you get the advantages from these mm -hmm. AI power tools, but perhaps within your, the limits of your uh, corporation. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, in academia or in where in your world, Barbara, do you share? Would you share? As, well? as a consultant, absolutely not, right? No. It would be That's not. why I said academic. <laughs> academic world. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, if you think back when uh, the Microsoft Language Portal was published, it was exactly for that reason that Microsoft terminology would, you know, become prevalent on the market and also drive certain concepts in, in the market. And so uh, when you're ready as a corporation to then share it with a larger audience, it may give you, you know, good opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, going back to smaller contexts, uh, I think that's already happening. If I trust what was shared in a pool party webinar a couple of weeks ago and also at their um, user conference, uh, there are companies already that are using a form of chat GPT for their corporate content and using it very effectively along with taxonomies and ontologies. And I think that's that's really where huge poten potential lies. Mm -hmm. So it, it really depends on where the sharing takes place mm -hmm. or how Cara? the sharing takes place, yeah. yeah. Cara, is that, uh, you agree? 
uh, this? Uh, yeah, I I would say that as a also as a consultant, uh, no no sharing would be happening because um, they won't even my my clients won't even talk to me without sign, signing an NDA. So yeah. they're mm -hmm. not going to want me to <laughs> to use ChatGPT or for that matter themselves. But I think uh, what Arl was proposing and and Barbara commented on about these smaller environments is also. Um, promising i believe i agree with that because then all of a sudden you can you have more reliability in the context when i use the context here i'm not talking about like context sentences but the general um sphere of of knowledge that has to be contained within a certain boundary uh whether that's a company organization or or, or whatever um and that's what we need in order for this to really work you know um i've had clients that have uh 15 different varieties of english in their organization or 10 you know 12 or whatever 50, many varieties of english each having its own terminology well that that kind of um, dialectal context is something very hard to nail down in a um, giant black box like chat, chat gpt and i've even tested it uh with uh with that and i find that it's very weak in determ in distinguishing between dialects of a language and disambiguating the words based on lo the locale for example so i i think that that's that would be the condition under which i would even consider using something like chat gpt is if it was contextually um had some certain contextual boundaries mm. and uh yeah so what do you think then the role of terminology proper terminology management and uh, you know having terminology management tools processes with workflows and, and all that what would be in a scenario where we have these positive effects or the, the positive let's say aspects of the ai powered engines uh, within let's say a limited environment within the corporate environment uh, how, how how would you then imagine imagine or think of the flow? Uh, would you be still doing the same things in the terminology management software? You, would you still be, you know, setting up the definitions and the source and and, and the, the context if you need so, uh, and working in that let's say environment and then sharing uh, with this engine, training it and retraining and then getting back and then continuing. Or would you envision or some other way of, of, uh, of doing it, some other flows? Uh, do we still need terminology management software or are we are we going to disappear? Are we the, the <laughs> that is uh, something that I, I, I would, uh, yeah, what, 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 what do you think? I mean, uh, let's, uh, let's start with uh, Barbara, I think. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not too worried for some reason. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a positive uh, person to begin with, but um, you will always need structured data and structured data needs that reliability. And I think we have provided that for years with our terminology management systems mm -hmm. and, for example, contributed to better MT results. And I look at it the same way. Now you may have a, a form of generative AI within a corporation that relies on the terminology at, at the very bottom, uh, then maybe at a on a taxonomy and ontology, uh, and then at just text that uses that information to be structured. And that has a positive effect then. Uh, at least that's that's how I imagine it. Obviously, I haven't haven't seen it, but um so yes we we do need that that smallest building blocks the the concepts and uh their representatives or their 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 terms that represent them in text uh to be reliable mm -hmm. my question is because in many cattles uh and you know i've been in this in this uh area for i think 23 years now i mean we were one of the first crazy people to start uh, developing a, a terminology management software and uh, in the beginning and, and up to now you see that the, the the terminology part was perceived as a support kind of software or a support module i would call it to these cat tools right i mean you have several cat tools and they would have some kind of terminology component in them because yeah well okay terminology we need also, but they wouldn't have this kind of uh, workflows or all this other functionality needed. Um, and I'm pretty confident that, that, that 
in some, let's say, minds, this is still the case. They, they think, well, we get the AI, which is even more amazing, even more magic, and perhaps we can just drop in a glossary type kind of term, term based like thing to train it, and that's it. We don't need to do to do more. And then we get out the, the, the terms again. We sit on an Excel spreadsheet. Excel is our biggest competitor, by the way. So, and, and, and then, you know, do some work there and feed it back. Uh, I know that for us that have the experience, we know that, well, this is not the case, but would, would you, how would you feel about such a scenario? What would be the, the drawbacks, uh, Kara? What, let's say, of, of the scenario, well, I have a list of terms, I shove them in, <laughs> pardon my, my thing, is, you know, I, I put them in the, the, the engine, trains it, and then, uh, you know, all is, all is good. Why do you know I need all these expensive things on the side? Well, um, like I said earlier, uh, we need the house. We don't need just the toilet. <laughs> so, you know, we need uh, all kinds of different information in, in, a, in a properly uh, supported, if you will, terminological entry, um, mm -hmm. including, as Barbara mentioned, this uh, hierarchical relations, these taxonomies and ontologies that can feed into other tools. It's not just for translation support, but for all kinds of things, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. controlled authoring, you know, search engine optimization, you know, automatic content classification, uh, you name it. There's there, And these are underdeveloped, er these are still underdeveloped areas, but I can only see huge opportunities uh, continuing uh, it, as they, they're growing as we as as we as we are witnessing now they're already growing and as as Barbara mentioned properly structured terminological resources can feed into ter machine translation systems and improve their output so uh, I think that it's not just um, these little uh, solution these little answers we can get from an AI system it we really need a robust uh, collection of various types of information that are interrelated. And we don't, we can't have that interrelated structure from, you know, from an AI engine, which just answers questions. And then there's, of course, the workflow. You know, um, we we uh, we need a very sophisticated uh, functionality to, to, from beginning of uh, identifying terms or coming up with new terms to, um, to checking them, going through the vetting process, then going through the uh, conceptual. Uh, descriptions and and annotations and grammatical annotations and then and then there's the relations with other concepts and then you know and then there's the the reviews and approvals and then there's the target language equivalents and a metadata about their about their locales you know there's so much that can can be needed in in this terminology management that um, like I say we can get parts of that from an AI tool, but we can't build the house. Yeah. So Nicholas, what what is your your I think you are one of our oldest customer, by the way, Nicholas. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we what 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 is your take on this? Uh, do we still need terminology mama solution even if we have AI tools internally yeah. in a limited let's say yes I think so. Uh, um, I think we both need uh, terminologists and, and terminology tools. Uh, even though um, generative um, AI might be a very useful help in the future um, in various ways. And, and uh, like Arl said before, if we can have a contained version that's uh, company specific per perhaps and trained on, on our um, uh, information material, both from the development stage and from the produced material that we have, uh, there would be a lot of useful information that we could access when we're working on terminology. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think, of course, yes, uh, it might be exciting to see where this is going in the future. Fiona? Yeah, I agree. I, I think we still need terminology management systems. Um, I think they're even more important specifically for localization, for content creation, um, when you use ChatGPT, for example, to, uh, to to make it easier there, um, I think it's even more important that we do good um, terminology management um, that really holds the information 
that's unique or important for a company. Yeah, and I think also we are forgetting sometimes uh, that there is, there is not just uh, textual information. I mean, uh, we note in term basis there is there are reference information, there is a, a lot of other information in the same concept in the entry, which does not necessarily fit back to a, a, a generative AI tool, which is such a ChatGPT, which is for for uh, text based. But again, we are, there will be other kind of tools. Uh, there is a AI tools, I don't recall the name, where uh, you, you put a, an image and it describes you the image. Uh, you, you know, uh, so there are a lot of other kind of fields and there is a lot of other information and cases than just the, the chat GBT kind of uh, scenario. Uh, Henrik, what do you say? Well, I was thinking of images as well. If we leave the text space, of course, there are some stages of terminology workflows that you could, like we said before, the more creative phases, you come to term creation, you could get like with the click loads and loads of suggestions when you get stuck. So this would be like neat. Also some mapping functionalities I think could be improved. You could map things from unstructured things to structured things, classifications. But it, what would be really neat would be just going from, for example, definitions to concept models or so verifying concept models, logical mistakes in, in sort of heritage through generic relations, all these things that this has been done or, or, or discussed. But now if we could generate concept models or diagrams through this could be an interesting help, I would think. May I just quickly add here that I, uh, when I had it generate definitions, it was not very good in identifying correct superordinates. So mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously that will also depend on domain again um, and maybe the way you ask your questions, but it, again, there are challenges uh, there. Mm -hmm. And I remember it changed a lot when I changed the question, the definition changed. Yes. The, again, coming back to policy, I think you said it, Fiona, yep. before perhaps a policy on how you ask the question. Perhaps it was you, Barbara, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 this is what I would like to understand better so that I can help my students understand how do I work with it effectively too. And I'm not even really good at it yet. So um, mm -hmm. we definitely yeah, need that, to explore that. that. And that could be a, that could be a weakness uh, that, you know, you get different answers. You're, you're asking in, a, in, a, in effect yeah. the same thing. Mm -hmm. different ways and then you get different answers i mean that's that could be a weakness fiona yes please yeah, i think in general it's kind of the big question for me also like how to feed terminology to the engine in the right way if i want to have the right answers because um maybe depending on this context or whether i want to be gender specific or un unspecific basically use that term or that term depending on the metadata basically i do have in my term base so um the question is like can i just upload a file basically or like how do i how can i feed it with the right information and metadata and background without you know repeating myself over and over again for example so things mm -hmm. like that I think, um, and how can you guarantee that it is kept the way you loaded it and it's not you know, making up things based on what you loaded at some point combines it with something else and then answers something completely different. Uh, so how do you also keep integrity uh, of your data in, in that in aspect? Because the AI is not made to keep integrity. I think it's made more to uh, access content, make sense of it, and then present it to, to a user. Uh, Sandra, what, what is your take? Uh, I think I'm overall I'm very excited about the potential for yeah. for AI in terminology management. But as as Barbara and Kara mentioned, you know we still need the structured data, and I think Nicholas also mentioned earlier, you know for innovative products and services there's some data scar scarcity, so mm. you, you need the terminologist right to come up with these new terms if it's if it's new software, and it's it's really a game changer in in an industry, you're not going to know those terms. That you, you do have to come up with those and, and be creative. And maybe AI can help with that, but it's it's you still need the structured data. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I would definitely like to see is is um, better cleaning, data cleaning, and as as Henrik mentioned, classification and 
and looking for inconsistencies. So we have this term base, you have your translation memory, and then you have in-country reviewers or your subject matter experts uh, making term suggestions and mm -hmm. linguists, other linguists. So how do we keep all this data, classify those, really summarize all of the different uh, databases that we have? find those inconsistencies and then help us to find patterns right because i think one of one of the our ai tools can really help us in finding patterns very quickly and mm -hmm. so yeah that's I think where where i would like to see this terminology management going so that we can really um, drive quality so so there is still future for terminologists and terminology management and terminology management software, uh, right, Arl? I mean, we are not going to be a dying breed yet anyway, so. I, I, I don't think so, um, but, you know, if, if we're dinosaurs, I, I, I love this analogy that came <laughs> yeah, out in don't know about about recently. If we're dinosaurs, remember that dinosaurs turned into birds. And so uh, <laughs> what terminology managers do will evolve and they're going to become more relevant, I, I think. Um, two thoughts I had with this, one is that uh, when we look at chat GPT, this is unstructured data, and this is a pendulum that swings regularly back and forth, and we're seeing the limitations now. We've talked about a lot of them with the unstructured data approach. Now the challenge will be how do we in incorporate the structured data in to get past those limitations, and I think it's the only way. So um, the terminologist is going to become you know, uh, it won't, won't be a Tyrannosaurus Rex, they're going to be, you know, a, a falcon swooping in to do things. Um, the other thing that I, I find intriguing, I think for, uh, perhaps for Kara and, and Barbara, is um, I just heard a few weeks ago that one of the hottest new jobs are prompt engineers. And the starting salaries for these jobs are something like two hundred dollars to $250,000 a year. I think that's going to go down as more people enter. But if I was a student, I would be learning all about this so I could go out and say, I'm the expert in how to solve terminology problems using prompt engineering. And I think those students are going to go out into fantastic careers with a long way to go. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a good point. And I think uh, there, uh, we, are, we are looking into this, uh, how to incorporate AI and all these positive aspects of AI into our tool, into TermWeb. Uh, we do have relations before workflows, automations, and all this stuff, but we have some ideas. You know, the simple examples that I did, uh, show me some uh, synonyms. I mean, this is a good way of getting the, you know, up, uh, approved one, and then you have a list of deprecated ones. Do not use ones very quickly. Or you can have, you, you can use it to uh, connect it to SEO and say, okay, uh, what is the SEO score of these terms that I have? Or is there something that is higher? So have some kind of background analysis that you send to an engine and get back some answers. And then based on those, you can recategorize your, your, your terminology or term base. So not necessarily create a term base, but maybe so, like create, put some intelligence uh, uh, in it. Yes, Barbara. But on a limited corpus, right? Yes, yes on a limited, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> we, we, we don't want to kick cows. You know, right. it's very easy to just connect and then say good luck terminologists yes. now you get everything here so we are very careful uh, with everything we do because if you suddenly get 20 suggestions 100 suggestions and you know you can just keep on pushing the button and you get another list of you know uh, suggestions th then you will spend forever trying to understand is this better or is that better and you know this terminology boards how people are discussing should we use this term should we approve this in a, in a term back imagine if you have thousands of similar kind of uh, uh, suggestions coming in it, it, it will be a mess so uh, we see it in a limited way as a, as a kind of let's say assist for some intelligent kind other other uh, tasks that you would have to go and do in google Okay, so you would have to manually go, go and do a searches and look for, well, you can incorporate perhaps some of those uh, kind of things in, in, in uh, term base. So that's good. I mean, there is still a future for, for us. So that, that is good, good to hear. Um, and uh, so we are coming close to the, to the end. Uh, I would like to just summarize uh, what we've said so far, that, that there are some positive aspects in this. 
Uh, we are not so eager to share our term basis yet. Uh, probably we need some policies in place. Public kind of uh, term basis, yes, they could be there to, to train and retrain. But we need, when we are accessing content, to be to be accessing also information about source, context, and and so to to have a trust on what we are seeing and understanding that this is where it comes from and what it is. Do you want to have a, a last word to to say? Well, let's say for Barbara, you're from B, and Barbara, that's why. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would love to see a more formal. Um, set of instructions or some guidance on how do we best use it and this is mm -hmm. maybe more from my academic point of view um, then I think to have uh, generative AI limited on a, a limited set of, of corpora or within a corporation for example would be very helpful um, and of course to have it integrated into a workflow and i there i don't know that i have really a, a, a complete vision but i know if i don't if i don't have a good workflow i cannot be productive enough and then that leads back to by the way i wanted to challenge you on terminology being expensive because <laughs> in my mind it's actually cheap, right? You have to get that glossary that you started your previous question with from somewhere and you better have a good glossary uh, so that you get good results mm -hmm. in using that glossary and that's terminology. And when you think of all the use cases that Kara gave, terminology is actually cheap. Yes. If you, yeah. if you do it right and you use it as extensively as possible, it's not expensive. Um, and then if you use tools such as uh, generative AI effectively, it becomes actually even cheaper and, and more effective. Uh, Karen, those are the three things that come to mind, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Karen, any last words? Yeah, I would say that um, it, it can be used with, but with caution because of the contextual, uh, you know, the concerns we had over context, whether that's, you know, um, locale related or semantically related, uh, th there has to be, you know, a re specified boundaries to the conce conceptual um, domain, if you will, in order for this to work. Whenever we uh, we use something like this for more of a um, uh, un unfocused uh, search, we're going to go into dangerous territory. Um, and so that's why I would say, like Barbara says, we need some instructions. We need to know when we can use it uh, and how to use it. Uh, if, for example, somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to upload this list of terms that I have and, and ChatGPT is going to give me a definition for each one of those terms and I'm going to import it into my terminology database. That yeah. would be very, very dangerous. Yeah. I just did a couple of searches um, before this call. I looked up the word tablet and, and it gave me, I asked for a definition of tablet and it, of course it gave me a definition of the, the computer tablet. But I was thinking about the, the medicine in a tablet you know, mm -hmm. the, the pharmaceutical tablet. So, and, and I looked up the word subway. Well, subway has different meanings in different parts of the world. And it didn't give me the right meaning. So mm -hmm. we can't just expect good answers out using this giant black box, which is for the whole globe. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's where we have to be very cautious. And so I see it as an aid. I could see using something like this as an aid in a terminology management system, but it's just like Google Google search. That's what we're getting mm -hmm. in a way. And, and that's useful in certain contexts, yes. But as long as we, um, I think some the word one of the words used by somebody else on this panel was mediation, okay? We have to mediate what we're getting. We don't know what the source is. You've already mentioned that. We have to have some oversight and me and mediation in order to make sure that the information we're using is reliable. And a, a seasoned terminologist knows this. Okay, but how many terminologists are there are there out there that doesn't know that don't know that because they haven't got the experience or you know um, or the background? It's not their fault, but they trust something and they uh, make a mistake because of that uh, uh, misdirected trust. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great, Cara. And uh, Arne, what do you think? 
unmute. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think the future is positive. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, very thoughtful responses here. I, I would say watch language technology providers over the next six months because mm -hmm. we're going to have to see massive changes to some of the data structures and things that have been in place since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. to account for this. And some of it's going to force very positive change where I think terminologists and terminology management are going to play crucial roles. Thank you. Uh, Henrik? I was using it to find a, a Swedish term for an English one and then the suggestion I turned it back on itself and then it contradicted itself. I think this is interesting of, of using its own output to, to become input to itself. This is an interesting mm -hmm. way you could go down. But I think my my I agree with what has been said and I, I thank you a lot, everyone else, because I learn a lot from you every time I, I meet you and I listen to you. Um, embrace it with care. Yeah. Would be, which is the same that you said, but that would be my final word. Sandra? Yeah, I would say be agile and adaptive, but also watch for new legislations that's coming out. You know, we have the AI Act in the EU. Um, here in the US, the Biden administration is waiting for public opinion. And so I think that'll change some of the regulatory um, nuances around what, what we can and will be able to do in the future. So, all exciting. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Fiona? Yeah, uh, I can only agree, and I'm really curious what the future holds for us. Yeah, I think uh, good things, I hope. Niklas? Yeah, um, I agree as well. And like, like I've said before, it's, uh, um, it's, um, it's going to be exciting to see where this goes. And, and I think it could be very helpful in many ways uh, but uh, embrace it with care. I think that was a good formulation, Henrik. Uh, uh, I would agree with that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for being part of this panel. Thank you for being part of these discussions. Uh, thank you all for that joined. I hope it was uh, interesting. Uh, there is This is still very new to us. Uh, from my point, I can, I can say that we have never seen as much interest in terminology management and terminology management solution as we are seeing right now. Uh, and we are seeing it both from end user corporates, but also from traditional language service providers. I have never been in a situation where we have so many people contacting us and uh, there is this need for structured high quality data. And I think this is where we are, and this is what we can, we, we are working on a daily basis. And I think that it's our time to shine. Uh, my feeling is that term, terminologist and terminology management is going to move from being uh, on the side of Batman, let's say, and it's going to be uh, more close to being the hero of this, uh, uh, of, the, of the movie in the coming uh, time. So thank you again, everyone. And take care, and uh, perhaps we meet again and have another call and discussion uh, like this. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye.